Hi, and welcome to lesson 9, which is on electromagnetic waves in Optica Media 2. In this lesson, we will continue our discussion of how electromagnetic waves propagate in dielectric media, and then we will uh, conclude the lesson by discussing what's the difference uh, when they start propagating in metallic waveguides. So let's begin with our step number one and go directly to Fresnel equations one. Fresnel equations are a very important application of the boundary conditions, which you spent so much energy deriving in the previous lesson. So let's remind you of the usual scenario that we have in mind. We've got two dielectrics. We've got uh, dielectric one and dielectric two, and we've got our incident uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation traveling in this direction. At the boundary, we know from observations that it becomes some part of it is reflected, represented by this arrow here, ER, and some part of it is refracted. But because we are using the index R for the reflected um, uh, electric field, we are going to use T for transmitted to represent the refracted part of the wave traveling in dielectric 2. So these arrows represent the K vectors or directions of propagation for the electromagnetic radiations. And uh, theta i is the angle of incidence, theta r is the angle of reflection, and theta t is the angle of refraction. And our main question is, how are EI, ER, and ET connected? We know from observation that not all of the um, uh, intensity or all of the uh, radiation is ref reflected and not all is transmitted into dielectric medium too. So we would have like to have some quantitative expression how these quantities uh, depend given the reflective indices n1 and n2 and given all of these angles theta i, theta r and theta t. And that's precisely the job of the Fresnel equations. So you see that they have very uh, important application when it comes to this scenario of electromagnetic waves traveling from one dielectric into a dif different one. So let's begin by considering our scenario and we know that the k since the k vector is pointing in this direction then the polarization of our E field can only be in the direction that's perpendicular to the direction of propagation. In other words when we consider E field along this line, it can only be in this direction here or in the plane that's perpendicular to the line. In other words, it can be resolved into an orthogonal component. So this red dot means that the orthogonal component of the E field is coming out uh, of the screen or into the screen. That doesn't mean that the E-field is polarized in that way. That's only one component of the E-field. E-field can be in any plane that's perpendicular to the direction of travel. And also, it can be resolved into the parallel component. This time, parallel, we mean parallel with the screen. So you see, represented by these arrows right here. And accordingly, we also have the B-field, and we know that if the E field is coming out of the screen, is orthogonal to the screen, then the B field must be parallel to it, represented by these, these arrows right here. And in the case when the E field is parallel, then uh, the B field must be orthogonal to the screen, meaning it's coming directly at us or into the screen. And we will consider these two scenarios separately. So let's see what happens when we only consider the orthogonal E field. Again, I remind you orthogonal with respect to the screen. So this is the case that we are considering. These red dots, they represent our E-field, so the components are directly coming at us or away from us. And we want to see what happens when we zoom in onto this region. Because remember that we have derived our boundary conditions for the uh, horizontal and the vertical components of the E fields and the B fields. So if we want to apply the boundary conditions, we must resolve the E field and B field into their vertical and horizontal components. So if we just redraw this, uh, this image right here, this is our incident uh, E field. Theta i is our angle of incidence, and this is the corresponding 
parallel B field BI. Parallel because E field is orthogonal. Using some very uh, uh, simple trigonometric uh, considerations, we see that this uh, angle of incidence theta i is given by this angle right here. And therefore, we can immediately write the components, uh, which uh, the horizontal and the vertical components for bi. And it's very simple. Bih, the horizontal component right here, is given by bi cos theta i. And the vertical component BIV is given by BI sine theta i. Now we are in a position to apply our uh, boundary conditions. We have four boundary conditions, but really the only two boundary conditions that we're going to need are for the horizontal components of the E field and the B field. And we know that the horizontal components uh, transform as they are. EH1 must be equal to EH2, and same for the magnetic field components. BH1 is BH2. Now, we know what BH is, but what is EH? EH means the parallel component of the E field to the surface uh, between the dielectrics, to the interface or the boundary. And you can see that in this image, at, we are looking at uh, the a scenario from the top down. So the surface, the interface, is parallel to our orthogonal E-field component all the time. In other words, we don't have to bother applying trigonometry to find out what EH is. It's simply given by E1 here and ER here and ET here. But I remind you, this is because we are only looking at the orthogonal component of the E-field. So we know that for the E-field, the total E-field, in dielectric one that's parallel to the surface must be equal to the total E field in dielectric two that's parallel to the surface. And that's given by the following expression. So for the E field, we have that EI plus ER is e, uh, equal to ET. But on the other hand, when we uh, consider the boundary conditions for the B fields, it's only the sum of the B fields that uh, are equal. Uh, some of the horizontal components of the B field, but we computed those. The uh, mm, horizontal component of BI is given by BI cos theta i, and the vertical as the uh, horizontal component of R is given by BR cos theta r. But we must be careful about the minus in front of the uh, horizontal component for the reflected wave. There is a minus because the B field flips direction as it gets reflected off uh, the surface. And together, these two must equal bt cos theta t. And now we can derive a nice expression only in terms of the E fields, because we know how B field and E field are related. B is equal to 1 over the speed of propagation of the radiation in the dielectric times E. And we also know what's the relationship between the speed in the dielectric and the speed of light um, in vacuum. It's simply given uh, by the refractive index, which we need to use to rescale the speed. So in the end, B is equal to N over C times E. We can substitute this expression for our BI, BR, BT, and finally we obtain the following. And also because C is the same on all sides, we can just divide by 1 over C. So we get N1, the refractive index of uh, dielectric 1, times EI cos theta i, minus N1 ER times cos theta r, must be equal to the refractive index in dielectric 2, N2, times ET uh, cos theta t. So now we have three electric fields. We've got the incident electric field, we've got the reflected electric field, and we've got the transmitted electric field. But we also have one extra relationship given here at the top, that EI plus ER must be equal to ET. And we can use that to re-express uh, one of these in terms of the other. And to do that, first we're going to simplify our expression a little bit further. From observations, we know that the angle of incidence is equal to the under, uh, angle of reflection. So we're just going to rewrite both of them as theta 1. Theta 1 uh, indicating that it's in dielectric 1. And to have our notation consistent, we will uh, relabel theta t as theta 2, because that's in the dielectric 2. And substituting for et, we obtain the following expression. 
that the ratio of the reflected electric field uh, and the incident electric field is given by this expression right here. It's n1 cos theta 1 minus n2 cos theta 2, all divided by n1 cos theta 1 plus n2 cos theta 2. And this is our first Fresnel equation. It gives us how much of the uh, electric field is reflected given uh, the two uh, 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 reflective indices for the two dielectrics and given the angle of incidence and refraction. But uh, uh, we obtained this, um, this ex expression because we started by re-expressing ET in our initial expression right here we can just uh, as easily express ER in terms of EI and ET. We know that ER is equal to ET minus EI. Therefore, substituting for ER, we get the following expression. We get the ratio between the transmitted electric field and the incident electric field given by the following. And that's our second Fresnel equation. So, are we done yet? Are there only two Fresnel equations? No, there are not. These equations, these ratios between the reflected um, electric field with respect to the incident electric field and the transmitted electric field with respect to the incident electric field are only for the orthogonal components. In other words, they're not for the total electric field. We still have to worry about the parallel components. And those we will look at in the following uh, step.